Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool every single day. Welcome to EP Live, everybody. This episode is dedicated to a brand new member, Chantel DeForge. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, you can hit that join button and support EPN. We'd love it if you did. Thank you so much, but let's get started with your rundown. Gamers won't have to wait much longer to start playing Kingdom Hearts 3. Square Enix has announced that after years in development, the highly anticipated new game is finally finished. Hooray! They've completed development, although they'll probably continue making minor tweaks and changes right up to launch. This is good news, particularly for anxious fans, because it means that there won't be any more delays for the game, which has already been pushed back several times. It was first announced at E3 2013, and fans have been waiting ever since Kingdom Hearts 2 came out back in 2005. Kingdom Hearts 3 lands January 25th. I freaking adore this game. What I played so far. I haven't played the whole thing at all, but I had a good chunk of hands-on time at E3, and I was just blown away by its beauty, and its just accessibility, and its fun, and its, uh, you know, obvious lavish attention to detail for the uh, the Disney properties that this uh, series has always paid homage to. I think this game is going to be such a great big treat in January. I can't wait to play this game with my kid. Um, she, her mind is just going to go poosh! because there's so many cool characters and so much cool stuff in this. Uh, it does look great. It played great. Music was great. Oh, God, I can't wait. This is great news. Uh, and uh, let's continue. Not enough politicians are getting serious about climate change, but gamers will be able to deal with it in Civilization VI. 2K and Firaxis have announced Civilization VI Gathering Storm, the second big expansion for the game. Gathering Storm will see the world ravaged by the effects of catastrophic climate change, including rising sea levels and intense storms. This will give players the opportunity to work with other nations to come up with solutions like new technologies and engineering projects so that humanity can deal with a changing world. Since the effects of climate change are becoming more and more obvious every day, people are going to have to start coming up with similar solutions in real life. In the meantime, Civilization VI Gathering Storm will hit the PC in February. No word yet on when it might be coming to the new Nintendo Switch version of the game, and I heard that this uh, Switch port is fantastic. I can't wait to check out this game again. I uh, loved Civ 6 when I gave it a shot, and uh, kudos to Firaxis for uh, uh, conceiving of this. I mean, Civilization the series has always been pretty progressive and pretty much a, uh, a great, y you know, perspective on uh, the different designs that different different civilizations have had over the years the different aspirations and the uh, and the different strategies that they've all had and it's given players a wonderful perspective on the history and the uh, the way that history repeats itself over and over again and yes these are incredibly um, I don't know, tumultuous times that we are living in in the world out there. Uh, and my heart goes out to everybody affected by all the wildfires that have been currently happening in uh, California. Uh, tragedies and senseless tragedies, pre preventable tragedies everywhere, but we've got to kind of change our thinking around all of this stuff. And it, honestly, it's going to be uh, storytelling and fiction and, and video games and, and simula simulations that uh, I think get people... Uh, reimagining how they fit in this equation, you know, what are we going to have to do as a, as a, you know, the human race? Because it's uh, like it or not, we're the shepherds of the future of the earth. It's going to be up to us to figure out how to solve all this stuff. We made a lot of this mes this mess, um, and we've got to clean it up. You know, it's as simple as that. But uh, yeah, am amazing. And I, I, I'm wondering actually. Because there's a lot of dystopian fiction out there that ta predicts the, you, you know, uh, the oil shortage or nuclear strikes or whatever. Uh, but there's very little sort of progressive fiction, which you, I, I hazard to call science fiction at this point. I don't want to call it science fiction because it's it's sitting there right there in front of us. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for fiction out there to kind of show us what we do as as uh, a group of individuals um, to curtail a lot of this peril that's that's headed our way, you know. Uh, and I think it's it's cool that it's going to be in games like this, and and hopefully in a lot of stories coming uh, coming our way soon. You know, I hope it's not all just end of the world uh, stuff that we get our entertainment from. Hopefully, it's the preservation of our world fiction uh, that will become a great new moment for us in storytelling. Would be great. 
Uh, after months of bad news, something good has finally come in about Telltale Games and The Walking Dead. Skybound Entertainment has officially announced that former members of the Telltale Games staff have resumed work on the final season of their episodic Walking Dead game. Telltale began closing down back in September, leaving the fate of their unfinished Walking Dead game in jeopardy. Skybound, which was founded by Walking Dead comic creator Robert Kirkman, first announced that they were hiring former Telltale developers to finish the game last month, but it took this long for work to start due to complicated legal issues surrounding the project. Now that work has finally resumed, the final episodes should be released in the coming months, although no precise release dates have been announced. There's also no word if Skybound will continue employing the former Telltale developers to create future games. I guess that all is predicated on the sales of this game. And I, I have a feeling that the good news surrounding this um, will propel people back to their digital stores and, and physical stores to check out some of these products. I, you know, we've been talking about some of the uh, Telltale uh, titles disappearing off of Steam and other e-stores out there. Um, but presumably, if Skybound is serious about this, they might have a real opportunity to scale back up again. Now, they're clearly not going to want to make a lot of the same mistakes that Telltale did. You can't just keep churning out the same kind of experience over and over again with a different coat of paint. That's honestly what caused the crash in the 80s. That was a big contributor to that. There just felt like there was this, you know, uh, similar kind of product being churned out there with different, uh, you know, paint jobs on the sprites and stuff. You, and I, I'm absolutely dumbing down what Telltale was doing because clearly there was a ton of work in telling these stories. Uh, but the core experience is the choose your own adventureness of uh, the Telltale games did give each one of these titles a little samey samey kind of vibe. I'm not saying anything new. Everybody internally knew that. Everybody externally knew that. All of us reviewers knew that. And uh, that always creates jeopardy in the game space, whether it's Tony Hawk or Lara Croft or, uh, you know, Assassin's Creed. If you've got too many experiences that feel not dissimilar from the previous time that you ventured out into that space, uh, you are eating into your future. And uh, that's what happened with Telltale. But... The concepts and the original kind of um, value that Telltale provided in their games is still very much evident. And I feel like uh, Skybound's got a real opportunity to turn some of their properties. I would love to see an Invincible, uh, uh, you know, game along the same lines here. Or maybe it's learnings from that, but also popped into, you know, some genre bending or busting, you know? Uh, maybe it, it's an adventure game with some platforming elements or something with some really robust storytelling, or, I don't know, just ripping through the comic panels in some way. Hell, I'd love to see uh, somebody do a comic zone beat-em-up type thing um, uh, with some really fantastic skybound level storytelling, but it's you're punching through comic panels and maybe we've got an illustrator drawing some of that stuff. Anyways, lots that could be done there. Hopefully Skybound's in it to win it, and they're going to be uh, supporting stuff like this for a long time. Uh, but excited to see what comes of these final uh, chapters in the Walking Dead series. It looks like Valve's attempt to blur the lines between PC and console gaming has failed. The company has announced that they've discontinued their Steam Link device and will not be manufacturing more units. First released in 2015, the Steam Link is a tiny box that lets users wirelessly stream PC games from Steam directly to their TVs and play them like a console. It was one of several hardware devices that Valve released around the same time along with the Steam controller. They haven't given a reason for discontinuing the Steam Link, although they promise to continue supporting existing units with new firmware updates well into the future. The good news is that this just gives Valve more time to work on Half-Life 3, hooray, which we're expecting to be confirmed any day now. Uh, the Steam Link failed, I think, mostly because people could just plug their PCs into their TVs with HDMI. That's what I did. Uh, and I have a Steam Link. Never used it. I just put the HDMI from my PC into the TV. I am definitely a couch gamer. I don't like to sit at a desk. I don't like to sit at a desk too much, period. You know, I do most of my work, honestly, um, on the run, because I'm traveling all the time, so it's on an iPad or it's on an iPhone. Um, or if I'm gaming or watching stuff and I, I have to kind of check in, I'm usually looking up from a, whatever screen I'm, I'm, I'm having to be lost in for my job and looking at a portable device to get most of my information. So I don't like to be at a desk that often. That's me, and I r recognize that that's, uh, I'm, I'm a rarity out there. Not everybody has the luxury to be a game reviewer or a movie reviewer like I am, but... Uh, uh, I don't like to sit at a desk that often. I mean, obviously I edit on a computer and stuff, but I, 
after working for five or six hours to edit something or to write something up on a computer, I don't want to sit at that same seat at that same desk and then start gaming. I've done that. Certainly I've done that in my gaming career many, many times over the years, but I know my preference is to sit down and uh, sit back and relax and chill and get lost into the, uh, to the screen that's in front of me or sometimes with the headset that's on my head. Um, but, you know, so I've all, uh, since, it's, since we've been able to, I've plugged my PC directly into the PC and I've had a, a decent console quality experience that way. Uh, without having to stream it, without having to uh, worry about any lag or bandwidth issues or anything like that. I, you know, I've certainly tested out the Steam Link when I got it, and I thought it was pretty cool for sure, but uh, it just was just as easy to plug my PC right into my television. And I think that is ultimately what sealed the fate of the Steam Link. I think most people just said, you know what, uh, I'll just plug my PC right into here, or I'll get another PC that just plugs right in here, and I'll, I'll just access my material that way. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, I, I feel like we are moving into a world where the hardware is d not really going to be dependent on that experience anymore. You know, we're going to have smart televisions that access these accounts, and uh, we're going to have Xbox accounts and PlayStation accounts and down the road Nintendo accounts, and we're not going to be thinking too much about what box is plugged in with, with whatever way, you know? And maybe Valve's already moving towards that. Maybe they're already thinking... Um, Steam should just be available on smart televisions in the future. I don't know. Things are getting crazy. All right, you guys, that's our rundown for today. Do me a favor and share this uh, exported, clipped-out, rundown video with the hashtag PlayForever if you can. But right now, we are going to move to this day in everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for November 20th. On this day in 1985, Microsoft opened the window on a whole new era of computing. The very first version of Windows, known as Windows 1.0, was released, becoming the world's first mass-produced graphical user interface for personal computers. Before that, users could only interact with their computers by using text-based inputs like DOS, so having everything laid out for you visually on the screen was much easier and user-friendly. Microsoft didn't invent the idea of Windows. Apple beat them to it by having a Windows-based interface on their Lisa computer and original Macintosh, which had launched a year earlier, and both Apple and Microsoft stole or borrowed the Windows idea from another company, Xerox. Microsoft had even worked with Apple to develop applications for the Macintosh, which is how they got an early look at what Apple was doing. We're planning that over half of our retail sales next year will come from, from Macintosh software. Naturally, this didn't sit well with Apple when they found out that Microsoft had been developing their own Windows-based operating system the whole time. The thing that made Microsoft Windows different was that it could be bought separately and installed on different machines, while Apple software was only made to work with Apple hardware. Windows 1.0 was a massive success, and as new versions followed, Windows eventually became the default operating system for pretty much every personal computer on the market. This propelled Microsoft to the top of the tech industry and made a billionaire out of co-founder Bill Gates. All right, you guys, it is time for us to review another trilogy, trilogy collection. This is Spyro Reignited Trilogy. Toys for Bob took Insomniac's code and all the art that they put into the first three Spyro the Dragon games, which came out on the original PlayStation so long ago. I don't even know what, that, like 1998? Was, was it 20 years ago that everything came out? Ages ago that they started coming out with the Spyro the Dragon games. And I remember enjoying those games quite a bit. I thought they were inventive and uh, beautiful little cartoon experiences that you could play on the PlayStation. Um, but time hasn't been so kind to those old classic PlayStation 1 titles. Lots of really weird triangles and crazy poly polygonal shapes and things like that in uh, some of those classic titles. Um, and we saw great success with the uh, Crash Bandicoot uh, trilogy collection that was put out last year. A uh, huge seller, and deservedly so. It was terrific. So it makes sense that Activision wanted to try again, and they popped uh, the Spyro franchise into the old uh, remaster mill. Uh, gave it to Toys for Bob, which is one of the most proven um, uh, sort of young game makers out there. I mean, they make games for young people. They've done it over and over again. They worked on the Skylander series. They invented it. Uh, but they've also done this kind of thing before, worked on licensed titles before, um, and clearly have some... Um, 
you know, love for the Spyro the Dragon mythology because they work Spyro into Skylanders. So it was a good fit. And they've done a great job. And what they've done with this game is they've uh, updated all the visuals, all the graphics. So everything looks a lot more cartoony, a lot more contemporary. It looks very much like, you know, a modern, uh, you know, mascot style platform action adventure game would look in 2018. But of course, we're using a lot of familiar, um, you know, level design and mechanics and things that we saw many, many years ago. So it's a nice fit, a nice marriage. And I enjoyed my time jumping into this game. And I, I can't really say a bad thing about the efforts uh, put forward to remaster these titles because I feel like there was a lot of love and a lot of craft, so much so that there's some uh, remastered sort of uh, work that's gone into reshaping Stuart Copeland's original music score. Stuart Copeland from The Police did the music for the Spyro the Dragon games, and they've uh, augmented them with more instrumentation, which is really cool. They re-recorded dialogue with uh, some of the voice actors that are uh, in this game as well. And Insomniac was really trying some funky things, man. They were trying to make us laugh with their cut sequences and juice the, um, the character designs and the character dialogue. Uh, things that I think went a lot further with their Ratchet and Clank games than, quite frankly, they did with the Spyro the Dragon games. But this is still very beautiful, cute stuff. And the whole sort of, you know, Dungeons and Dragons uh, kind of aesthetic, this whole fantasy theme aesthetic is really cool. All the castles that you run through, the giant ogres that you have to defeat, the, uh, you know, sh the, the flamethrower breath that Spyro has as he burns up uh, frogs and lots and lots and lots of sheep. All of that stuff is really lovely. Even the floaty kind of physics and stuff have all been carried over, so sometimes it becomes a little tricky to make those jumps properly and land on those tiny little platforms. I remember being frustrated 20 years ago. I continued to be a little bit frustrated playing some of these levels in 2018. Um, but, you know, as I sat there and took it all in and played it with my kid, which I thought was important as well, my, my six-year-old daughter, Ruby, I wanted her to kind of see this stuff. And she did have a smile on her face. But it does feel a little thin. It does feel, uh, you know, not as... I guess tactile and fun, as even Crash Bandicoot was for me. I, I enjoyed re-experiencing the Crash Bandicoot games in um, their devilish complexity. And, uh, you know, some of those levels are just so damn hard. And I was getting very frustrated playing Crash Bandicoot. With Spyro, it wasn't so much that I was getting frustrated because it, it was a forgiving experience for the most part. It's pretty easy to sort of race through and, uh, you know, free the dragons that have all been, ca you know, captured in uh, uh, in statues in the first game or save the little baby dragons later on in, in subsequent games um, and defeat the wizards and all that. So it felt a, a much easier kind of um, access to get to everything. I enjoyed and appreciated the scope and the scale and the ingenuity of the level design from 20 years ago, but you know, frankly, we've played so many better 3D action platformer games since then that I think this these three titles, as good as they are, they rely so much on your affection for these characters. And that's not to be discounted. I think that's really good. But I feel like in terms of out-and-out -out gameplay, there are just better 3D action adventure platformers out there. Many of them have been made by Insomniac. And I find it really tough to go from something like my obsession with Marvel's Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4 to jumping in, which is made by Insomniac, to jump into this, you know. And it's not that th these are bad games. They deserve the adoration and the, and the love and the appreciation. And there's, there's certainly this fetishistic kind of uh, uh, affinity to craft something that is beautific and, and uh, honors our memories of Spyro the Dragon, which is great. But I guess what I'm saying is that I just wasn't blown away by the core game experience. I was playing the game and found myself kind of, you know, fading a little bit. I was chilling as I was playing the game. I wasn't like, oh, my God, what, what's going to happen next? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Uh, I just sort of routinely went through the levels and the stages as I went from game to game and checked stuff out. And I had a good time. Uh, the flying levels were really tough because sometimes the cameras just get wedged into different obstructions and, uh, you know, you're only up in the air for a little bit. It's not like you're just taking off and flying wherever you want to go. Uh, so you've got to go off and, you, you know, shoot down some planes and, and shoot, shoot down some trains and uh, blow apart some chests and do everything within a time limit. 
cool sort of bonus mini levels and things like that that uh, that challenge you. I thought that was cool. Uh, but sometimes, yes, some camera frustrations. And, you know, honestly, that was most of my challenge with the game was just like trying to deal with the uh, kind of rudimentary 3D design of uh, moving the camera and pushing it into the right place that I wanted it to be, or landing precisely onto a little pad as as Spyro would kind of hover and and you know sloppily kind of slide to the thing. Now I, I don't want to sound like I'm just ragging on these games because I think they're cool and I think that if you never experienced them or if you did experience them and you love these games, I think you are getting uh, a beautiful coat of paint across all of these titles and you know the HD up res and and the, uh, the the copious amounts of new animations that have been put in all add layers and layers and layers of charm in here and it's actually a good deal for the amount of content that you get as well three full titles um, a lot of extra bonuses as well like the ability to fast travel in each of the games makes a huge difference so if you're a collectomaniac and you want to get every single egg and every single you know jewel and every single and free every single dragon you can absolutely do that uh i had fun but i certainly didn't have as much fun as i had with the crash bandicoot games um and so i can't give this remastered trilogy a uh, as big of a score but i think you have to kind of weigh your love and your adoration for this franchise against whatever I have to say or anybody else has to say. If you are a freak for Spyro and you've been wanting to play these games in their most, um, you know, gorgeous way, in the most gorgeous way possible, this is it right here. You know, Toys for Bob has done a damn fine job. And uh, I think, you know, for the price point, it's not even a full price title. I think it's 40 bucks in the U.S., so it's probably 50 bucks in Canada or something. It's, uh, it's a pretty decent deal as well with lots and lots of content and cool music. And uh, it's, it's the history of 3D game design right there, all sort of, uh, you know, sort of modernized for all of us. So I dig it. I, I am certainly not a... I am certainly not a non-fan of Spyro the Dragon. I just feel that the time has kind of passed for this kind of level design and these, this kind of gameplay. We've played many other titles that are, are better than these games, unfortunately. Um, the Ratchet and Clank games are the, the ones that immediately come to mind for me. I'm going to give Spyro Reignited Trilogy a 7.5 out of 10. And from one trilogy to another, it's time for a buried treasure. Today's Buried Treasure takes us back to 1996 for the PlayStation 1. It's Die Hard Trilogy, where you play as John McClane in uh, basically vignettes, which are pretty robust vignettes from each of the three decent Die Hard movies. The first one's a classic. I really like the third one. The second one gets a little bit grating for me, but you play sequences through all of them. It's a third-person shooter, so you're, uh, you're running around taking out all kinds of bad guys and terrorists and Die Hard 1 inside the building. You're in the airport in Die Hard two and in, you're in uh, different vehicles racing around inside of New York City in Die Hard 3. The graphics are very crude if you're looking at this right now but the Die Hard franchise especially as we edge ever closer to Christmas is something that I think a lot of us think about because it was so seminal you know especially John McTiernan's original was just so wonderful. I wish there were better Die Hard games that we could point to but I think in this era of reliving PlayStation 1 classics especially with the mini coming it's kind of interesting to look back at some of the, the titles that attempted some of the stuff they actually made a sequel to this thing i never tried the sequel the die hard trilogy 2 game i never played that at least i can't remember anything about it but i do remember having a smile on my face for die hard trilogy 1 yes it was rough and yes even in the day it was rough but uh you know and today it looks way rougher but still some cool gameplay moments that evoke these cool movies i think it's worth hunting down if for nothing else the educative properties that a, a title like this holds john mclean i think you are a deserving of a better game or some kind of redo or a do-over type of experience because die hard has been lifted from not only in movies but in tons and tons of video games over the years but i think die hard trilogy for the playstation one definitely qualifies as a buried treasure all right, guys, we've got something very special lined up very soon. Uh, I just want to give some shout outs here. Thank you, Blade Blur. Uh, it's great to see you in here, my friend. Uh, Paul Adamson, Wesley West, Ryan Govier. Uh, I hope I got your name right. Tyler Dub, great to see you. Um, a whole bunch of you guys in here. Tyler Fisher, great to see you, buddy. Taz, 
John uh, Hunthrop, awesome. Sam I am one 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 NHS NHS ADM. Uh, we got Gamer Freak eighty four who guessed my score for Spiral the Dragon. Uh, Audrey Leon, great to see you, my friend. A um, whole bunch of you. It's always fantastic to see you in our live shows. Yes, and do remember that this EP Live, we are live. So uh, watch our Twitter and, and subscribe and uh, hit that little bell so you can get notified and come and join us. We have awesome people in the chat, which is really cool. I want And Spidey82, how you doing, buddy? Um, we uh, I got a couple of nice shout-outs. Well, first of all, I was on uh, Mark Saltzman's radio show, which airs all over North America um, last week. He recorded the the interview and then it ran over the weekend and stuff. But uh, he we wanted to talk about uh, the um, uh, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. So he had me on and we talked about it and, and talked about the uh, the Pokeball Plus and all that stuff. Super fun game. It actually got me playing Pokemon Go again. I was out playing Pokemon Go with my kid last night and she got obsessed with uh, collecting all kinds of stuff. So I think that is Mission Impo- uh, or Mission. Um, uh, accomplished with Pokemon Let's Go, because I think they want people playing Pokemon 24-7, right? So you play it on your mobile phone, then you go home and you play it on your Switch. Uh, I also want to give a shout-out to um, uh, Chris Bronco 76 who took a picture of me on the big screen um, just before one of the movies. I was interviewing uh, a- Andrew from Nintendo about Pokemon Let's Go, actually, about Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. And he took a photo and said, uh, you're a legend, man, which is really sweet. Thank you so much. Um, that's very, very kind of you. Okay, you guys. Uh, just this morning, I had the distinct privilege of uh, sitting down with a Disney animator. His name is Benson Shum, and he has just worked on Ralph Breaks the Internet. Let's have a look. Benson Shum is here with me, and we are going to be talking about Ralph Breaks the Internet. Congratulations on this movie Thank finally so hitting theaters. You've been working at Disney for a number of years now, right? How long have you been there? I've been there for about six years now. So my first film was Wreck-It Ralph. Then it was uh, Frozen, Big Hero 6, Zootopia, Moana, and Wreck-It Ralph 2. So just those little ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me I was in the presence of a genius? When you were, uh, you know, in school, and I understand that you took uh, some courses here at uh, Vancouver Film School, which is really cool. Did you have it in your mind that one day you'd be working on these massive Disney animated features? No, it's always been a dream to work at the studio and to actually be a part of those films has been incredible. This is the most beautiful miracle I've ever seen. When you're dealing with a team the size that must be behind Ralph too, I'm I'm not sure how many people worked on the movie do you think? Uh, It's about 600 people altogether and the animation department has about 70 people. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about the process? Like, how, how does, does your work sort of get into the finished product, you know? I mean, there has to be, I guess, in a homogenous kind of quality to all of the work, and there's all of these disparate elements coming together. How does that all happen? So there's several departments, and for animation, we sit with the directors to kind of go over what they want in the shot, and we show work in progress until it's approved, then we pass it on to other departments. And it's great because as they go through the departments, we see how every department elevates the quality, then see it as a final, like, part of the whole final film, it's amazing. So you worked on specific pieces. I guess that's how it kind of works at Disney Animation is that you don't sort of work on the whole thing all at once. You work on pieces and then you assemble it together, right? Yeah, so we get assigned specific shots and specific characters and then we work with our colleagues to collaborate on scenes so that they kind of seem seamless. Would you say that animation as it stands right now with with the computer work that's being done with movies like Ralph 2 is as much technology as it is, you know, traditional artistry? Uh, yeah, we do have still the traditional animators working with us directly, so mm-hmm. like Mark Ken, and he's like an animation legend at the studio who created Ariel and Jasmine and wow. Tiana. Is it a balance of the past and the future at Disney? Yes, definitely there is a balance. On the walls you still see the original Mickey Mouse drawings all the way to the most recent uh, animated films as well. So, And that's one thing that's so great about it is that because of the history, you try to reference that but also look towards the future. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Take me back to when you were a student and you were learning uh, a lot of your craft. I want to know, you know, what has surprised you about the professional world of animation? Like something maybe you didn't consider or weren't aware of? Some of the work that maybe goes into a movie like Ralph 2 that 
you just have a real appreciation for now that you've made a, a bunch of movies in the professional world? I think a lot of it's growing up. You know, you see the movement and you see the craft, but working at a studio, you start to realize there's a lot of thought behind every single pose and every single scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what makes Disney amazing is that a lot of the characters are very sincere. You know, they're thinking. And I think that's something that I've learned right. through my years there. I'm a huge fan of what's going on with Disney animation, and I've been a big fan of Pixar for a long time, but it's very fascinating to see. It's almost like this resurgence over the last few years of just this incredible work. I, I have a six-year-old daughter, and I just see the delight in her face. And it must feel so gratifying to know that you're impacting families like this all over the world, right? Yeah, it's amazing, especially when you see kids or adults perform the actions that you animated, you know, and they're just running around trying to be Elsa, and it's amazing. Yeah. People are going to go to this movie in droves uh, starting this weekend, and, I, you know, what should they be looking out for in terms of your work? What did you provide to the movie? I would say when you watch the princess sequence, there's a shot that animated with Mulan, and that's one of my favorite Disney princesses, and to be able to animate her was a dream, too. And now for the million dollar question. You know, out of the projects that you have worked on, is there one that is your personal favorite? or one that you would love to revisit if there is going to be a sequel? I don't know if there would be a sequel, but I did love working on Zootopia because yeah. I love animating animals. Do animals talk to you? No. Benson, amazing to meet you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And keep up the good work. Thank you. And we'll keep watching your movies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Disney, for setting all that up. Now let's kill some Nazis. This is uh, Battlefield Five, So I thought we would let's play and chat. I've had it for a few days, but I haven't really played too much. I'm... I, I'm playing. Oh, that, he should have died right there. I'm playing the uh, War Stories mode, which is the um, the single player mini campaigns, and um, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. So let us know what what it sounds like. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm gonna pick this one up. This one looks cool. Um, it seems a little echoey, but I don't know if it's just. Uh-oh, uh-oh, run, run, run away. I'm, I'm gonna die. Okay. Got you. Got you. Got you. Oh, come on, you don't, oh, he's gone. Hi, everyone. All right, so this is Let's Play and Chat. So remember, chat us up, ask us any questions, any comments. You're, I have you're no... playing the story mode right now? Yeah, it's kind of the uh, the mini story stuff. So I've got a bunch of missions, which I, they're training you to like go to a bunch of different objectives right now. Gorgeous game. They did a really nice job with the art. Who are you playing as? Like, what is the story? I'm a, um, a young British uh, private, and I've been sent out on a mission. I'm in uh, North Africa. And right now I'm trying to take out these radar dishes. And I've got a buddy that uh, I think has been hurt. And... So you're killing Nazis right I'm now? I'm killing right? Nazis and blowing up stuff right now. So let's you go mean do that. very fine people. <laughs> so that's, isn't that what we're supposed to call them now? Pardon me? Are, are Nazis very fine people now? <laughs> yeah. Believe it's crazy me? that they put a, a bunch of grenade, a bunch of dynamite right beside where I have to go and drop the dynamite. <laughs> okay, right there, okay. <laughs> okay. Why don't you just use the dynamite that was there? Okay, I'm just gonna do that. Goodbye. Oh, sh I, I, I always... That didn't I, do anything. Someone pointed out I'm wearing flannel and so are you. Oh or yeah, look at that. That's I, right. I always it's, take the plaid off when I realize we're both wearing plaid. What, like, I, I just blew to. up dynamite and nothing happened. Oh, okay. You gotta play it on the radio. Okay, gotcha. Those All German right. radios are built to last. Okay, the bomb is on. You gotta on. really put the bomb oh, on. Oh, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. It's gonna go. Scheiße! <laughs> Where is he? Oh! Man, Dice knows how to make explosions happen. That was cool. Uh, question from Blade Blur. Yes. Do you oh. think... So you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, question, do you think now that you are back in Go, Yeah. I guess that means Pokemon Go, would yeah. you play it more? I mean, you're on the run. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was. It, they've updated it quite a bit since the last time I checked it out, and I've been having fun. Oh, there's a medic. You just shot a medic, Vic. You're not shot, supposed to. Do I that. shot a medic. <laughs> You're not supposed to shoot a another medic. Nazi. I you just, just you just violated the Geneva Convention. I did, man. You just yeah. committed a war crime. Yeah. Things move fast in war. 
Although you play as partisan resistance fighters in this game too, right? Yeah. And they're technically committing war crimes just by doing what they do. So, oh, really? Yeah. It's okay. illegal to be a partisan resistance fighter. Okay. A lot of under illegal inter- things went Under down. international law. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So... I've got to go blow up that other radar dish. Look at how beautiful this is. And this is streaming at a terrible resolution. Yes. So you're not getting the full the full spectrum and here. And the frame rate's a little bit lower. And too. I'm playing on um, Xbox One S, not the X. But this is ta- this is taking my breath away on the uh, on the X for sure. Ooh. Maybe take Maybe, cover. Yeah, yeah, don't stand right out there. Right yeah, there. they're all running away. Okay. Uh, question from Nintendo Boy. Yes. Vic, have you been trying out Power A's new wireless controllers for the Nintendo Switch yet? No, they're I have licensed, not. They're licensed by Nintendo. No, I have not. I gotta check those out. Are they like little Joy Cons or li- or a big? Uh, Good question. One? I'm a little bit behind on. Uh, oh, oh, oh! Grenade, 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 grenade! Got me. I'm a little bit behind on uh, new. My guy's gone. Look at that. <laughs> Twenty-two to forty-two. Twenty-year-old dude. Sorry, guy. Oh, so you're my Sorry, William. Born. Um, yeah, I'm behind on on uh, peripherals on little uh, on little controllers and stuff. I've, I've been asking for uh, game codes more than <coughs> hardware. Yeah, it's harder to send a, a code to download hardware than it is for yeah. software. <laughs> I have Tetris Effect in the hopper, so if VF, uh, VR Grid is here, uh, he will be very happy about there. that. You can't get up there. I can get up this you way. You can get up there, yeah. Okay. There's got to uh, be grass or dirt, otherwise So I'll be reviewing the VR mode of Tetris Effect very soon. I'm, I'm planning on playing some of that tonight. Might stream some. Question from uh, Game Freak 84 Question, hey, Vic. Oh, come on. I sh- look. If you get shot by a sniper and there's blood yeah, splattering, real, yeah. you don't move yeah. after that. Yeah, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Game Freak eighty four. Ha- yeah. How does Battlefield five compare to Battlefield one? Uh, or worse, same, similar. The same engine and everything, similar, right? Similar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you just got grenaded. I totally did. Are you playing? Wow. Are you playing the same guy? Yeah, William yeah, Sidney. For sure. He's dead again. Dead. He's only twenty. Uh, yeah. Uh, it feels similar, but with better tech. Um, I, I enjoyed Battlefield One. I thought that was a pretty cool game, and yeah. I loved, uh, you know, the aesthetics of Star Wars Battlefront. This is a great I, developer. I have a, I have a thing I want to ask you about because yeah. in the story for this, yes, you play. You can play as both sides. You can play as the Nazis. Yeah, I haven't gotten that far. And yet, that, it seems so weird to me that they would do that here. Although I don't mind playing as a Nazi in a story mission. It, mm-hmm. it just seems weird because in Battlefield One. You didn't have any missions where you played as the Germans, mm-hmm. and it just felt weird because if if there's a conflict where you're gonna show the German side, it, obviously you would it, it would be World War One before World War Two, because in World War One the Germans weren't the obvious villains right. that they were in World War Two. So it just seemed, when they announced that it seemed so weird to me that why why didn't you let us play as the Germans in World War One? Right, right. That that would be a lot less you know icky. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That just felt odd to me. Well, I mean, these guys have been making World War II games for a long time. You know, they, they got to keep trying new things. Yeah, I mean, I like showing the German side just because it, it's... Is that guy doing push-ups? Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, he's trying to get up. Not, not because, like, I want to... Oh, this is some weird clipping right there. Uh, oh, poor man. That always happens. I've seen that in games a lot. All right. Like I like when they show the German side in World War II, just because it's nice to see the perspective of the bad guys. Right. But yeah, like why didn't you do that? World War One would have been a much more opportune place to do that. Gotcha. Felt weird. Uh, plant. Kaboosh. Run for the hills. Well, here's a good question from Taz. Okay. When Red Dead Online goes live, will you meet up with other members of the EP Posse? Yes, absolutely. Um. Yeah, I totally want to do that. I, I, uh, how, how many people, I'm asking the chat, how many people have friended me up on uh, Xbox? That's where I've been playing Red Dead. I have it on PlayStation as well, so I guess I'll download it for both machines. But, uh, okay, here's my question. Where should we play Red Dead online? The PlayStation 4. PlayStation 4? Because that's 4? the one I have. Okay, we'll play, we'll play <laughs> on uh, Unless there's cross-platform, and then who cares? And um, I think what I... 
what I can do is send out, um, I guess, a YouTube, uh, YouTube and Discord to try to. Because if I if I say I'm I'm playing here and I I I tell everybody look for me or whatever on I Twitter, have, it's going to reach one, two, a lot three, of people. Four, five, five PS4s and one, two, three, three Xbox Ones. Three Xbox Ones. So PS4 wins. I think more people have the PS4 than the Xbox One. Well, so they, it just makes oh, what, sense. Yeah, they do. It's it's way bigger. Yeah. But uh, it looks better guy, on the a Xbox. Guy right there. Which guy? He's over there. No, it's easy. Yeah, kill that square head. Come on. <laughs> I think they know I'm here. <laughs> uh, these things are fun. I was taking out some plans with this. I like that it's kind of like a sandbox of uh, chaos. Somebody's saying that they added the German side in the story because people requested it from World War One, from Battlefield One. But that—that's uh, my point. Is is playing as a German in World War One is completely different than playing as a German in World War Two. Right. It's a completely different thing. Like. Uh, as far as whether you're the good guy or the bad, there's no good guys or bad guys in World War One, mm. but in World War Two, that's not the case, obviously. Right. Um, a couple of people are asking if you're going to play the new Spider-Man DLC, Vic. I am. I'll have a review. I'll be playing that tonight, actually. That and uh, Tetris tonight. But uh, my kid and I are both obsessed with the new Spider-Man. She's waiting for the. I've, I beat the uh, first DLC chapter. I'll, I'll play the uh, the second one tonight, and I'll have a review uh, as early as Thursday on uh, DLC. I've got a bunch of reviews in the hopper. There's lots coming up. You're dead. You're gonna die. Who, where, who's shooting me? There's a, like a gun or something up on the hill. I guess this is the chaos of Battlefield, right? This is yeah. the difference between, uh, y you know, playing as uh, oh, wow. Call, Call of Duty, uh, um, uh, the blackout mode. Is this plugged in? It's plugged in, but it uses a lot of juice while you oh, do yeah. it. I forgot it uses yeah. more power than it can use when yeah. it's plugged in. Yeah. Even all the work, we're not taking that pity. Hopefully, right. I can get past this damn thing. I mean, it's I've got I've got a bunch of missions to do. It's not just kill these two um, satellite dishes. Maybe I'll try to be a little more stealthy. I'll see how that yeah. one, how it goes. Um, what announcements are you looking forward to from the Game Awards? That was a question mm. from. Hang on, I want to give it the... the, the uh, that's from Abby Jamison. I think we're going to see some uh, Metroid Prime. I think Jeff's got mm, a great relationship with... Uh, not yet. I think we might. Not yet. He's got a great that's relationship like, that's with like a Reggie. Spring, we're going to get a spring Nintendo Direct, and then it'll be really shown off at E3, and then we'll get it next year. You think? A year, like, a year, like holiday 2019, yeah. Didn't you hear? We just did a story on what Reggie was saying. We, he doesn't like to show games until they're like six months out. Yeah, well... He also, they have a 20 million, um, uh-oh, they spotted me as I'm trying to goof around in here. Gotcha. Yeah, kill him. Gotcha. Um, they have 20 million switches to sell. This is true, right? This is true, they need to get the hype up. They do. And they got to show what's next after um, um, Smash Brothers. Because if you're the type of person who doesn't, doesn't like Smash Pokemon, you have no reason to get a Switch yeah, right yeah. now. I'm very, very, very fired up for Smash, though, which is crazy coming from me because I've been... It's taken me a long time to kind of... I think of, I am, too. I've never been a big fighting game guy. It is so I've never so liked Smash, fun. but it looks so great. It's yeah. so fun. I just I want the story mode where everyone is dead except Kirby. Seen, that just really appeals to me for some reason. Yeah. And I, I remember having a great time with the 3DS game, so this is like the best version of Smash, and you can bring it everywhere with you, which is crazy. Okay, so we'll take this. Take it. Okay. Uh, Nintendo Boy 17 has a question. How do you marathon Star Wars movies? I ask as I marathon. I guess he means like which order? Ah. The order, you just watch them, you watch all three in the order they were made. Yeah, they... Star Wars four. You watch five, all six. Yeah, you watch. No, you watch the first Star Wars seven, movie, seven, and then eight. No, you watch. And then you go out and get it. I don't know which. No, you watch all three Star Wars movies. Okay. You watch Star Wars, the yeah. first one, and yeah. then its sequel, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Do you remember seven? Chewie, we're home. 
Oh, awesome Vic, movie. there's only three Star awesome Wars Awesome movie. Movies. There's only three Star Wars movies. Oh, okay, so yeah. four, and five, you, and seven? Yeah. Okay. Or, no. And, and Rogue One? <laughs> <laughs> you watch all three in the order they're made. No, I like Return of the Jedi. Which happens to be the order they take I, place I like in. Return of the Jedi. See, every time somebody opens the can of worms of Star Wars... <laughs> it just primes my pump, those patriots. Yeah. Well, you don't need to watch Attack of the Clones. You can just skip right over that, or you can watch it I, in in uh, in super. It's not fast my movie. least. It's not my least favorite of the prequels. I mean, like it. I, I honestly, I don't see how attack. I get that Attack of the Clones is bad. I hate it. Yeah. It's just like I hate all the prequels, but I don't see how it's worse than the other two. I don't see how Revenge of the Sith, Sith is better than. It's all the love story. Yeah, that sucks. Garbaggio. But everything. Uh, but there's Jar Jar in the first one. There's. Uh, terrible acting in the third one. Like, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot to hate in all of them. So I, I nice. this, everybody always puts a unique amount of hatred on Attack of the Clones, and for me, I don't feel that. I just watch I hate it. it as, watch it again. I, I I watched all three of the prequels uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. To, before um, Force Awakens came out. Like, I, I'm not saying it isn't bad. I'm just I don't think it's uniquely more bad than the mm. other two. I actually like three. That's a fun movie. Oh, I know you do. That's a fun movie. Yeah, you also like Rogue One. I um, uh, love Rogue One. And uh, you don't like Last of the Jedi, La Last Jedi, do you? Uh, Would you say you like it? I know uh, you don't dislike it. I do it. like the movie. I don't like it as a Star Wars movie. Right. But I do like the movie. I think it's a cool movie with lots of cool things in it. But yeah, there's a reason why it's so divisive. Jordan Cunningham says, Attack of the Clones is much better than The Phantom Menace. I, I, see, I, I like, would agree with that. I, I like I The agree Phantom Menace because it does have some... Uh, that's what I like to do, is just chase a medic into a building and shoot him! You're not allowed to blank. shoot medics, Vic. Okay. It's, it's illegal. The, the medic's not supposed to shoot back. They're not supposed to have a gun, but you okay. shouldn't be shooting medics. That's bad. Even if they're Nazi medics, they're medics. You, know, you don't shoot a medic. Right. In real life, anyway. Yeah. Man, this is, this is, this is the epitome of the battle battle uh, uh, fields. Look at that texture on the gun. That's beautiful. It's amazing, it's but great. just the chaos. Like you don't know where the bullets are coming from, man. Like, that's battlefield in a nutshell. It's like I don't know where to go. I'm so fragile. You know the Germans are wearing camouflage. Oh, look out! Yeah. Ah, run! <laughs> The Germans are blending into the background, which is the idea. That's not doing anything. So is Rommel nearby? Like, are you? Is this where Rommel is in North Africa? In the tanks? Yeah, is he nearby? Like, I'm not sure. I, I would imagine so. This is 1942. Then did, did that do anything? I threw a grenade. Oh, it was an airplane. Blade I, Blur says Phantom Menace at least had the dark mall fight. I, but I also like some of the intrigue of Phantom Menace as well. I thought that some of that was pretty cool. But the, there's intrigue in Attack of the Clones, though. No, there were those silly <laughs> monsters. <laughs> what the frack? Okay. Scheisse! That guy. I, I like how they just preemptively censored the swastikas. Did they? I don't see any. I see the... The German no, army come symbol. On. I don't see any swastikas. Do you? I'm seeing the the cross. The, they they the, must have swastikas in this game. Because they uh, they have to take them out in a lot of places, right? And like not just Germany, but other countries make them censor it too. Come so on. Maybe they just didn't. Where put are these any guys in. shooting me from? I think I read about this because they didn't want people in multiplayer playing as the Germans to be running around wearing swastikas. On the oh, because of yeah. all the uh, the Nazi. Yeah, because like. You stuff know. that's happening right now too. Yeah, I mean, I if you're get, it's a game that's historically inaccurate. Like if they're gonna have one thing that's historically inaccurate, you <laughs> might as well damn rocket. They're saying <laughs> if you're gonna change one thing about World War II, that's something I would change. Get it's rid like, of the yeah, get rid of the swastikas. Like okay. Although that kind of dilutes it, but that, that's the point. It's a video game. Okay. I hear them. I don't know where they are. Okay, I've got to get over there. I have been doing some carnage. Not bad for a 20-year-old private. Okay, get over there. What time is it? 
Uh, you got a clock right there. I can't see. It's 220. 220, okay. How long are you going to play for? Um, oh, no, shit. Another, run. Run. No, There's 15, four of them. There's four of them. 15 minutes. No run. Grenades. Run. Oh, you know what? I have one of these. Oh, do it. Oh, shit. He, he saw it and ran. That's <laughs> that's awesome AI. Did you see that? No. That's great. He saw your rocket launcher and ran. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's great. That's okay. great AI. Okay. I got all these. All right. That was fun. Oh, I got some grenades right there. Perfect. Are you going to get the uh, GameCube uh, controller for the uh, uh, Switch when Smash comes out? No, I'm not that hardcore. I mean, if I start, if I just start killing in the game and I'm just, I just rock at it, maybe I'll get the GameCube controller. What is the, is the Power A controller like the GameCube controller uh, that that person was talking about? I don't have my phone to Google it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, run! Yeah, see, look, they have the little cross there. Yeah. The old German army cross from World War One, but they don't have... They, there would be a swastika on that in real life. Nice. New objective. Like, you haven't seen a single swastika yet, have you? No. So they they definitely don't have... What is one. this? Oh, pick up ammo. Let's get it. Okay, and what is this? Oh, more of that. Yes, please. Okay, should we go driving? Sure. Uh, so. Sam I am says uh, I'm against censorship. It's a question though of if you're gonna change uh -oh. one thing, how much do you change? Because every World War II game changes stuff, right? Every time you play a World War II game and the German soldiers near the end of the war aren't 14 years old, then it's changing something. So they always sanitize it a little bit. So the question is how much oh do you God. sanitize it? Get him! No, you bastard! Oh, they got me. <laughs> Those uh, flying missions, yes, Gamer Freak, they do. I have not got to that yet, though. Uh, Jordan Cunningham, comment. I said I would never buy Black Ops 4 at full price, but my friend sold it to me for $10. Black Ops 4, the new one. Mm. I'm really enjoying the competitive multiplayer. Let's no, it. it's really fun. Why did I, I'm kind of curious why your friend sold it for 10 bucks, though. That's uh, they very generous. They probably just wanted out, I guess. Yeah, But you could sell it at EB Games for more than that. Friend, operative word. Oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. I guess, um, yeah, that's what friends are, right? I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't have any friends. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I hate about friends? You know what I hate about friends? <laughs> uh, okay, so re infiltrate remaining enemy garrisons. Uh, what are the plans? Tyler Fisher wants to know what the plans are for EP Live this week. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, I actually no. wanted to mention... Uh, Not tomorrow. Because <laughs> we're, we're doing, we can talk about the Tomb Raider thing we're working on now, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's out there. Go yeah. watch our Tomb Raider thing. Go yeah, to, we, we to uh, YouTube.com slash Tomb Raider, and you'll see oh, our Oh, I see. We scenes. have a third chapter of the Tomb yeah. Raider thing. That I just got new footage for Chapter 3. Okay, so got you, to, got uh, you. Okay, so no no uh, EP live tomorrow. This is it, right? Like, we, we don't have the unlimited resources, so we have to bounce back and forth between what we can accomplish every day, which is fine because I have a bunch of reviews to shoot tomorrow. Um, so no EP live tomorrow, but we will be back with uh, EP lives on Thursday and Friday. Does that sound good? That sound good? Yeah. Trust Taz. us, we love doing EP live. It's our favorite thing. Taz says GameStop or EB Games says the Black Ops Four is getting traded in for eleven dollars and twenty three cents. Whoa. That seems really low for a game that just came out. That must mean they have a lot of returns on that. Uh, that right. means that. Call of Duty is edging very close to uh, being a free-to-play experience, is what that says to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's kind of shocking that the it's map that low is right enormous away. in this mission. This is really cool. Any questions? Any thoughts about Darksiders Three since it's out this next week? Uh, I've asked for a review copy. I can't wait, wait to play it. I don't know anything about it really. That's a uh, game I really hope does well. Yeah, me just too. Because, not because I'm that big on that franchise, but because I just like that the idea of that company coming, you know, rising from the dead and being formed into a new company. Totally. At a new publisher. It's so important to, to not have all the money to market a game, but to come out with something clever and kind of double A, you know? And yeah. I, I don't know if it's triple A. I don't know. I don't it's, know what the production quality is. It's quality, AAA it, for Europe. But I, I, I just, it's important. The business needs that, you know? And, and uh, 
Because so look out. Very inventive ideas come from things like that. You gotta not run because they're you can't see them anymore. Really well. They really are You're camouflaged, dead. aren't they? Yeah, well they're I'm not dead yet, man. Come on, have some faith. <laughs> the thing I hate about friends are... The thing I hate about uh, camouflage <laughs> is it makes it harder to see the enemy. <laughs> the thing I hate about Nazis... They're crafty. Oh, come on. Oh, don't reload You should be able to, like, in a situation like that... Maybe... Oh, look out. I, maybe I should... Maybe I should not say this because this is a really good idea I just had. But when you're in a situation like the, when you're reloading and there's a guy right in front of you, I like this gun. The game should automatically, instead of just dropping the clip you pull out of your gun, the game wow. should automatically throw it at the guy that's shooting at you. Mm. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Like it's in that situation where you were like, oh shit, and you had to reload, oh. and the guy was right there. In real life, you could throw your cl your empty clip at the dude to like sort of you know just because, right? Yes. Like. I would uh oh, reinforcements coming. They should they should put that into a game. That'd be awesome. I I am having a great time with this, by the way. This is really it looks cool. Fun. Yeah, it's it feels like carnage is coming at me from every direction, and it feels tight. It feels fun. What's your favorite World War II first person shooter? That's a question from Jordan Cunningham. Ooh, I think it's still the first Call of Duty. That was such a uh, profound game. I mean, there's a reason why that, that franchise is so damn popular, you know? It, didn't, it wasn't an accident. That first game was excellent. I guess Saboteur doesn't count because it's third Saboteur person. Saboteur was amazing. That's third person, though, Oh, right? my God. You just stopped my heart there for a second. Mine is uh, Day of Defeat, which I guess maybe doesn't count because it's just a mod for mm -hmm. Counter-Strike, no. but... I love that game. We'll, we'll count it. In today's Day game, we was, will count it. I was, I, I might have talked about this before, but Day of Defeat, like, I was that guy in the game. Like, I was the guy who had 20 kills for every one death. Oh, wow. Like, I was the guy that everyone thought was hacking because I was so good. Really? Yeah, I was, I was Whoa. so good at that game. Like, I, like I said, like, my ratio was like 20 kills. Oh, for one death. what the? Ah! I should play that game again. I should get back into it. This is fantastic. Come on up and see all your dead brothers, man. I killed a whole bunch of your you Nazis up here. Come on, come up. You can't get me. Yeah, you teach those Nazis they're not allowed to invade Africa. There we go. That's we only for that's only for British people and French people to invade <laughs> Africa. <laughs> Getting all political on us. Okay, give me some of these, and those are all done. Okay. Oh, new Wolfenstein people are saying for favorite uh, World War II Wolfenstein shooter. was uh, awesome. But does that count, though, because it's alternate history? But this is alternate history. Too. Yes! It's all, it's all alternate history. Like, none of it is real. Has there ever been, like, a hyper, historically accurate uh, World War II game? Uh, not that we talk about. Yeah, like one that is, like, oh. like the historically accurate equivalent of a, of a simulation game? I don't think so. That'd be pretty cool. I loved Big Red One as well. We actually we did, worked with Activision and um, Treyarch on uh, the making of that game, and that was amazing. And it, I did a lot of research on. Uh, That's where you interviewed Mark Hamill, right? Why I did, um, but they did. A, there was a um, the the Big Red One Infantry Division. The first Infantry Division was just an amazing group of warriors and fascinating stories and uh you know perfect uh, subject matter for a game to kind of focus on them and celebrate them but i really enjoyed the game too it was great Hell no, uh d9000 says blake knows what's up yeah just had to read that out loud that's all right <clears throat> got one buddy the thing i don't like about d9000 <laughs> Backhanded compliments. So, so he thought that needed to be said. Like, yeah. Isn't that just a given? <laughs> Doesn't everyone just know that? <laughs> oh jeez. Do you know what oh, my favorite? Geez. Do you know what my favorite thing to do in Red Dead Redemption is, Vic? What? Red Dead Redemption Two is taking the hats off people I kill. Yeah. I just keep changing my hat. <laughs> I, the first time I did that, I was like looking all over for my hat. I was like, where, where did I put my hat? And I kept riding around, <laughs> running around. Well, I think I left well, my I hat keep back at the other I keep camp. losing mine, so whenever I kill a bunch of guys, I just take their hats. You know where it is, though, right? <clears throat> where? It's on your horse. Oh, yeah? It's always there. It's on your horse, yeah. Oh, my God, really? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you can't lose your hat. You just well, got to you gotta look into your horse inventory. What I've been doing is literally just killing people for the sake of taking their hat. Right. So I guess I don't need to do that. Nope. <clears throat> you bastards are dead. You do it. 
Oh, you're like Indiana Jones in, in Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark. You're I'm gonna, gonna blow, blow up the Ark, Grenade! Because <laughs> that's that same kind of grenade launcher he uses, right? Blow it back to God, shit. Ah! Jones, do you realize what the Ark is? And it's the, a radio. He gets a fly in his mouth. It's a transmitter. It's a transmitter. S speaking to it's a God. Beacon for speaking He's to French. God. I was doing but French. Was that it, French? It sounded uh, like Arnold. Oh, okay. But it's within our reach. <laughs> you want to talk to God? <laughs> Imagine Arnold. Let's go see him together. I've got nothing better to do. This is after he thinks Marion's dead. Oh my God! I love that movie. If only spoke of Itos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's now I'm trying to do Arnold and I can't. <laughs> Jordan Cunningham says, I loved Medal of Honor Frontline. It got me hooked on War. Why is this not a Medal of Honor game? Uh, I don't know. Can you crouch? I feel like you should be crouching more to try and be stealth. Should I use this? Do it. Fuck it. Kill those guys. Yeah. Kill those white supremacists. Oh, you missed. Oh, I got one of them. Got the medic. <laughs> <laughs> Medic Hunter. They Metal really are camouflaged, huh? Well, that's the idea, Vic. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Chucking a smoke grenade. They're not like the Canadian Army in Afghanistan where they're wearing green camo for the first, like, year. Were they? Yeah, that was a thing. Because when, when we went into Afghanistan at the start of that war, the Canadian Army didn't have any, like, desert-appropriate camo, so they just wore green camo. Hey, look, the bushes are moving. Did I get a couple? I think I did. I'm not sure. You, if anything, you scared them. Which oh, is I got oh, a I couple. Scared, oh, here's a good question from Adrian Leon. Did you notice the new she ra series on Netflix? I did. Uh, I have not watched it, but it's cool that it's there. I want to check it out. You should watch it with your daughter because I hear it's like very girl power. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little behind on Netflix. So I've got um, reviews of Narcos <laughs> and uh, I'm almost caught up on Netflix. Is it? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've got reviews of Narcos it's like and a uh, job staying on top bodyguard, of bodyguard coming. I've watched I'm, I've watched both of those shows. Isn't it nice that British shows are like like three episodes? Oh yeah, I like that. Uh oh 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 oh, 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 oh. damn it. Oh, no. These Germans oh, are I'm very. Alive. I'm alive. No, I'm dead. I'm dead. They're very efficient. Oh, in the way they're okay. You. I am having a blast with this. I will play some more, and a review is incoming. No pun intended. Uh, but that's a l tiny little taste of the um, the story mode of Battlefield Five. Should we uh, stream some? If I don't have a review for you by Thursday or Friday, we'll stream a little bit more of the okay. multiplayer. You guys can watch me get crucified and just killed by. Myrtleized. As opposed to how good you just Yeah, I was, I was really good. I was just I was killing a lot of Nazis there. Okay, bye, everyone. Uh, but yeah, I've been having a blast. DICE makes beautiful games. And uh, we'll have more on Battlefield Five soon. And we've got a lot of content headed your way. So please stay tuned. And remember, if you uh, aren't behind on watching EPN, which is almost... It's, we're almost like Netflix here at EPN, aren't we? We, ha we have <laughs> full seasons of things that you can watch here. Uh, go ahead and binge our content, and if you dig it, hit subscribe. You can hit that little bell to stay notified if you're so inclined. We got a super chat from Timberwolf. Thank you so much. We definitely should do a multiplayer evening. That is going to happen. Uh, should it be with this game, or should it be with Red Dead, or should it be with both? Both. Both. Okay, let's do a multiplayer with this one. Stay tuned. Watch the discords and watch the, uh, the YouTube community uh, panel there. I'm not going to post it up on YouTube because it can't be randos. It's going to be us, okay? It's going to be our little group. Uh, but thank you so much for watching. Uh, you can hit that join button if you want to become an EPN member. Thank you to everybody that has been doing that. And we've also got merch available on our epn.tv slash merch landing page. It will shoot you off to 8-Bit Beans or Amazon or uh, Teespring or Designed by Humans. Lots of cool stuff that you can, uh, you can pick up and it has the EPN branding on it. Thank you for your support, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow with a brand new rundown. Have a great time tonight and play forever.